I'm the chief architect of New Shepherd, and I've been working on the program from the very beginning. So I joined Blue Origin in March of 2004 as one of its first 20 employees, and that was actually before the New Shepherd program even officially began. In that time, it was just a concept, a little bit more advanced than a napkin sketch, and I helped build the team that would eventually design and put it together. And lift off. When most people look at the New Shepherd, they might see the astounding technology. To me, New Shepherd is about the wonderful team that I've had the pleasure to work with over 18 years. I'm one of those people, and there are a lot of us at Blue, where opening the road to space for humanity is a calling. As humans, our grandest accomplishments happen because uh, we are explorers by our fundamental nature. There is such a grand space in the universe out there with so many resources and so many things to explore. I almost would not know what to do with myself, and I have very few useful skills, I think, that are not related to flying people to space. There's very few jobs, very few professions, and very few places where you have that combination of working on something so important that is at the same time so challenging and so rewarding. I can't wait to fly on the new Shepard vehicle. Everyone we talked to that has been to space uh, described going into space as a life-changing experience. I don't know how I feel, actually, on that date. Uh, obviously, it'll be a, a cause of celebration, but it will also be a period of, of a lot of self-reflection. This is a once-in-a-lifetime, once-in-a-career opportunity to follow a program from start to finish to such a major goal. So I hope I will feel that it was as meaningful as the amount of time and energy that we put into it. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a true pleasure to be here in Prague speaking with you. Um, I've been invited to Prague uh, by the Futureport organization the Futureport Youth Conference is on Thursday. So um, that conference will seek to connect to youth about the ages of 16 to 26 to inspire them to pursue careers in technology with the goal of, of making a positive impact on the world. Um, so my, my presentation here uh, is, is primarily geared towards that sort of broader audience, but I've been told that uh, this audience is a lot more technical than that. Um, so while the slides might be very basic, I'm just going to add detail, <laughs> um, a lot of extra detail, and then afterwards we're going to have some time for questions. Uh, so first of all, you know, as, as that uh, video introduced me, I'm Gary Lai. Um, although I'm associated pretty heavily with the New Shepherd program because I was at it from start all the way through um, getting into commercial operations, um, I actually work on quite a few other things at Blue Origin. Um, Right now, Blue Origin, we just, you know, I was employee number 18 at the company, and I'm, I'm the second longest tenured at the company. But we just recently hired our 9,000th employee. Um, so it's a huge company right now. It's all across the United States. And only 5% of people at Blue Origin work on New Shepherd. So 95% have nothing to do with New Shepherd. They're working on the next steps on, on programs that I'll talk about um, a little bit, like the new Glenn program, which is our orbital launch vehicle, or the lunar lander programs. So my role at the company is I have something to do with every single one of those programs in terms of architecting them, uh, determining the, the high-level technical direction of those programs. But I still spend most of my time uh, on New Shepard because I feel like it's my, my baby, not just uh, charting the course of, of what's next to come for it, but also even occasionally sitting on the console in mission control during a launch. Uh, so that's a little bit about what I do. Um, and, this, and by the way, I'm not here for Blue Origin. I'm not here, this is not a Blue Origin event. I'm here for myself, and everything that I'll talk about is from my own heart and my own opinion. So don't take this as a Blue Origin, um, Blue Origin position on anything. So we are at the dawn of a new space age. Um, I truly believe that, and one that will change everything 
about how we live. And, and that also means that we're at the sunset of the old space age. And like all historical, unlike all historical ages, we can actually pick a date that the, new, the old space age um, started, which is October 4th, 1957. I'm, I'm sure I don't need to tell this audience what that was. That was the launch of Sputnik. Um, the first artificial satellite launched into space. Um, and it was almost, uh, uh, it almost didn't happen, right? It was launched by the R-7 uh, intercontinental ballistic missile. Um, and it was very much the brainchild of, of a single person, Sergei Korolev, uh, who was the chief architect, the chief designer of the Soviet uh, space program. So Khrushchev was not at all interested in artificial satellites. He was interested in, in in developing an intercontinental ballistic missile to, to assert Soviet authority. Um, so actually, two weeks before this launch, uh, Sergei Korolev himself was not very interested in, in designing uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles. He had grown up all, all throughout his childhood dreaming about space and space exploration. And he became involved and, and heavily uh, knowledgeable about rockets because of that, but, but obviously, um, rockets that launch satellites can be used as weapons. So that's how he got pulled into the program. So he worked largely with a small team in secrecy to design Sputnik and to make sure that the R7 could launch Sputnik. And it was only two weeks before the launch of Sputnik that he, um, in a meeting with Khrushchev, who came to visit uh, the, the Baikonur, that he rolled out and said, uh, we could show that we are better than the United States, the Americans, if we can launch an artificial satellite to space. And Khrushchev said, okay, go ahead and do it. <laughs> and, and didn't really think about it or, or that it would have such a, a world-changing um, effect uh, at the time. In fact, uh, on the morning after um, Sputnik was launched, the, the newspaper Pravda didn't even carry it as a major story. I believe it was around 100 words about it, and, and yet it electrified the world. So that is the day the, new, the old space age started, and it has obviously changed everything about how we live today. Um, you know, we, we, use, we take for granted uh, space technology. It's, it's so embedded in our lives that we don't even realize it. Obviously, if you use Google Maps or you use any uh, navigation program, you are using satellite technology. Or, or you um, look at images from space, um, that, those are collected by satellites. If you look at a weather forecast, those weather forecasts with high precision are possible because of satellites. Satellites have ch and space probes have changed the way that we view ourselves in the universe. We have went to the furthest stretches of the solar system, like Pluto, as well as our own moon. We have stared into the deepest depths of the cosmos with our space telescopes. And then communications, the, the satellite communications network is, is fully integrated into our overall communications system. Um, many, not only television, but also internet traffic is carried by satellite. In fact, uh, about this time next year, many uh, cell phone companies are working on it right now but you will be able to seamlessly connect and you won't even realize it because they're gonna do it on the back end. When you make a cell phone call on a, on a system like T-Mobile, which will be the very first to do it, if you are out of, out of range of a, um, a tower, it will seamlessly connect to uh, a satellite network. Uh, the SpaceX Starlink network is being upgraded and you won't even know it. So you're gonna be making satellite telephone calls, everyone in this room, uh, pretty soon. So it's, it's changed everything. Um, there are over 5,000 active satellites in space right now. Active meaning they are operating and they're doing some mission. Um, if you go into a dark a place and it's a clear night, um, I like to go hiking and backpacking in the wilderness. And I, if it's a clear night, I look up in the sky and I can spot a satellite within one minute. Every minute there will be something up there that, sh that will be flying overhead. Um, space is also a very big business. Um, 
you probably, I mean, this is probably the audience that would know the most, but do you realize there are 150 space launches every year? Every three days, two or three days, something launches into space. That's how busy it is, and it's just getting started. And it's also a lot of money. So uh, as of this year, um, space is about uh, 500 billion euro market. So that is twice the size of the economy of the Czech Republic. And it is also growing, well, I don't, that means different things to different people, but it is big. Uh, it is also one of the few sectors of the economy that is growing very fast, 10% uh, per year for the last seven years. It's been growing 10% per year. So the projections are by 2030, it will be a $1 trillion economy. So if you are interested in getting into this field, there are certainly many jobs or investing in it, and there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and the remarkable thing about the fact that it, there is so much activity in space is despite the fact that we are still using, up until recently, the same basic rockets that launched Sputnik. In fact, the Soyuz, which is the immediate derivative of the R7, is still flying today still flying people uh, into space. Um, and those rockets are not that reliable. Um, and they're also very expensive. So um, today, as we sunset the old space age, only 620 people have ever flown to space in about 65 years. That's less than 10 people per year. I was number 600, depending on how you, you count. You know, when you, the, the, this is just an aside since I have a lot of time. Uh, when you fly like on a crew together of six people, like wh how do you order them? <laughs> you don't know. So I, I was the last person to enter the capsule. So I, if, that, if, if that's the way you count it, then I'm the 600th. But only 620 people have ever been in space. Um, and, you know, 31 of them have been in the space on New Shepard, and that number will grow very quickly. 2% um, of them, about 2% of people who have ever flown in space have died in the process. So it's wonder that, that people are, you know, up until now have been willing to take that risk. And, and obviously we cannot see a major expansion of human space activity if that, if that number uh, stays the same. Space launch is extremely expensive. Um, you know, if you're technical, uh, people um, might not realize the, the economics of it, but it is extremely expensive to launch something in the space up until now. Um, about to orbit, it cost about 10,000 euros per kilogram. And that you just can't, like, if you do the math in your head so, and say, well, I weigh 60 kilograms and, and, uh, so, and, and multiply that, it's, well, you've got to lift yourself and the vehicle that you're in. <laughs> So it, it's extremely expensive. The most recent uh, prices that NASA is paying per astronaut are about 70 million euros to launch someone to the, the International Space Station. Um, and payloads as well, it's about the same price. And, and that the reason is because we throw, up until recently, we've been throwing rockets away every single time. So the average uh, launch vehicle cost about $100 million. So imagine, you know, the aviation industry. Um, would that have ever taken off if every time you flew across the ocean, you had to junk the airplane, right? It would never have happened. And yet we still have a 500 million euro space economy, even though we're junking the airplane, you know, the essentially the equivalent of junking the airplane every time. Okay, so why are we in a new space age? Because we are starting to learn to reuse the rockets. And, and we're doing it a lot now. And uh, that takes me to New Shepard. Okay, so what is New Shepard? You might look at it and see a space tourism vehicle. You know, some people derogatorily say um, it's a system for launching rich people to space. I mean, so undoubtedly, the people that are flying on New Shepard um, today are primarily rich. Um, it, it is still expensive, right? It's not something that is affordable for most people. But if there's anything you take away from this, I want to explain that that is not the reason we are doing New Shepard for the tourism aspect. 
and it is not the reason that I've devoted my uh, large part of my career to it. We are doing New Shepard to learn how to make rockets completely reusable and spaceflight routine. And we picked tourism as the market because if there is any single market in the entire world that will demand that things are cheap and demand that they're safe, there's no better market than tourism. Right? It will force us to make it inexpensive and to make it safe. And if we can, and we are well on our way to doing it, if we can, there are tens of thousands, if not millions of people that can afford to fly on the vehicle. And we will get a huge amount of practice, right? I mean, his analogy to this is, uh, when did air travel really take off? When did people really start flying on, on airplanes? Well, they were invented in the early 1900s. They were curiosities for many years. They were very, very dangerous, sort of like how we are in, in, in the rockets. People died all the time flying them. Uh, they were daredevils. And then it transitioned into World War I, and people flew airplanes for the military, and they died all the time. It was very dangerous. When it really started taking off is when the airmail contracts started, right? The people realized that you can mail a letter by airplane much faster than on the ground. And that is when they got just so much practice flying and people wanted it to be inexpensive and they wanted their mail to arrive that it uh, took off. So air mail is like space tourism for us. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it to learn how to uh, make it completely routine. So New Shepard, just a little bit about it. It's named after Alan Shepard, who was the first United States astronaut. Um, he went to suborbital space. Six passengers, there is no pilot. Um, everyone is, a part, is, is actively in, in the, there's nobody to watch over you other than the person on the ground telling you uh, instructions if you need them. Uh, we passed the Kármán line, so that is the internationally recognized boundary of space. It's 107 kilometers is, is the peak altitude of New Shepard. We have views through the, very, the largest windows ever flown in space. The windows are so big that when you're looking, seated and looking through them, you can't actually see anything out of your peripheral vision. It's like you're floating in space. Um, there's a, an experience of weightlessness, and it is fully reusable. We have designed it to fly 100 times um, over and over again. 99.5% of the vehicle is reusable, just some various spare parts we throw away. Um, so as uh, the introductory video, you know, that, that video was made just before I flew. And this is actually um, from my launch, which was on, on, on March 31st, 2022. I had the opportunity to fly. I was asked pretty last minute, actually. It was like a week before the launch. I got a call and said, you want to go? And I said, my bags are packed. <laughs> Um, I was very enthusiastic to launch, um, and uh, this, this is actually all footage from my 10, launch. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, command engine start, 0. So it goes up fast. I mean, the, the initial acceleration is 1.5 Gs. So the net acceleration is, is half a G. Um, and, uh, a, a, and is a, a traditional vertical uh, rocket. Oh, by the way, even though it is a suborbital vehicle, I know all, everyone in this audience likely understands the, the, the difference between a suborbital and an orbital vehicle. It, we practice pretty much all the really hard parts of an orbital launch. Um, I mean, for instance, I'm sure all of you know about SpaceX, right? They, they also uh, vertically launch and land rockets. Um, they reuse the first stage of Falcon 9. Um, Falcon 9, that first stage, is a suborbital rocket, right? It, it releases the second stage. It never, the, the first stage of Falcon 9 never makes it to orbit. It flies a suborbital trajectory, 
and then they actually ignite the, uh, the engines in space to slow it down. And then when it re-enters and hits the atmosphere, it enters at about the speed of, uh, of New Shepard. So with New Shepard, although it is a small, smaller vehicle and suborbital, we are practicing everything about uh, an orbital launch with a reusable first stage. Um, then you separate and you get uh, several minutes of, of weightlessness. Um, you can do whatever you want there. Somersaults or uh, just enjoy the view, which is tremendous. By the way, um, this is, I don't know who, anyone recognize who this is? This is uh, Kobe Cotton, who is one of the most popular YouTubers uh, out there. Uh, I think he's, he, uh, the channel that he has is called Dude Perfect. Um, he, uh, it, it, they're very well known for doing these incredible trick basketball <laughs> shots. But he flew on our last mission, and he just um, released a 13-minute video on the, on the Dude Perfect uh, YouTube channel. So check that out. It's a very good video. But this is actually, we didn't doctor this photo. This is the view from New Shepard. Um, as uh, just before, he, I think at this point, he's getting back into his seat, so you can clearly prove that the Earth is not flat. <laughs> you can see the, um, the thinness of the atmosphere, and, and I can recall very vividly. So that, that's uh, Kobe Cotton's flight. Uh, this picture was taken on my flight. This is what I saw. Um, so, you know, what, what this picture doesn't show is that the blackness dominates the view, right? We're, we're looking at the Earth now, but when I looked out the window, I had the impression that it was down there somewhere. Earth was down there somewhere, in a very, very clear line of the atmosphere, um, in which you could tell was below you, but otherwise dominated by the purest black um, that you can imagine. And that, that goes from blue to black very quickly. You know, within 30 seconds after liftoff, the, the sky was very dark, and, and the sun was overpowering. So you don't often see that um, talked about, but when you're out of the atmosphere, if the sun and, and the capsule rotates in space, but when it rotates to where the sun is in your eyes, it is so bright that you cannot look anywhere. My, I had to close my eyes every single time the sun would come close. Um, and then we reuse them, right? So the, the, um, the reusable, the, the, um, the way we reuse New Shepard is to bring uh, the rocket back the way it came, it came, but in the opposite direction. We use aerodynamic fins on the bottom to steer it until we're right over the, the pad, and then we relight the engine. And it is a very tricky maneuver, but it's been perfected. So it is a precision landing. Sometimes we get blown a little bit by the wind at the very end, but, but um, in which case the, we say just land wherever you are on the pad, but we could land on a postage stamp if we tried. Um, meanwhile, the capsule, uh, we, we separate the capsule in space and it descends uh, separately. By the way, we often asked, um, you know, why don't you just stay with the, um, the booster, right, and re-enter without it? There's a couple of technical reasons why, you know, but, but the highest, uh, the, the biggest reason is, before we tried this the first time, would you want have been, wanted to be the first person <laughs> to land on that booster? Um, we also get the practice where, because we are trying to, to practice a, with a large orbital rocket, which will have multiple stages, right? They, that will always have a stage separation event, and the capsule will always come down separately. So for a lot of reasons, we always land uh, the rocket. But by the way, since I know this is a, a different audience, um, there's just some more technical detail uh, about this. So we use hydrogen oxygen. It's the, the highest performing rocket propellant um, in existence, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. Um, the high, liquid hydrogen is, is challenging because it's so cold and, and it's not very dense. 
and it's highly, highly flammable. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, about 20 degrees uh, Kelvin um, is, is the um, temperature of the propellant. Um, and there's only a single engine. It's called the BE3 engine. It's a, a tap-off cycle engine. It's a very unique cycle. If you, if you have a, um, knowledge of rocketry, um, I believe um, this is the only ta operational tap-off cycle engine I am aware of in existence. It's kind of a magic engine in which uh, it basically, we, we burn the propellants in the combustion chamber and we tap off a little gas from that combustion chamber and we use it to drive the turbo pumps. So there is no separate gas generator. Um, you know, a lot of rocket engines that have turbo pumps and all high performance rocket engines have turbo pumps. They actually have a second rocket engine on the side that drives the turbo pumps, uh, like a gas generator or a stage combustion or a pre-burner. Um, New Shepard has only one combustion chamber and we just tap it to drive the turbo pump. So it's very simple. It also makes it very easy to throttle the engine. So this engine throttles from 110,000 pounds of thrust. Sorry for the Imperial <laughs> units. That's 500,000 newtons or so, um, all the way down to 20,000 uh, pounds of thrust or about 100,000 newtons. So that continuous range of throttling, that is unprecedented to be able to help design a rocket engine that can operate through that range. And that's the way that we can, you know, when, the, when New Shepard lifts off, it's very heavy because it's full of propellants, right? Um, and when it lands, it's pretty much empty. And so you have to go from 110,000 pounds or 500,000 newtons down to 100,000 newtons, five to one ratio. It's very hard. A vehicle like Falcon 9 will do that by having a lot of engines, right? They have nine engines on the Falcon 9. That's why they call it the Falcon 9. And they land on one of them um, because they can't throttle the Merlin engine so deeply. And as a result, among other things that you saw in that video, right, we can, we can pretty much hover uh, the vehicle. Just right now, it's actually basically going at constant velocity. It's not speeding up or slowing down. The thrust to weight ratio is one. We're basically hovering. We just didn't stop it. Only New Shepard can do that. And it makes the... Um, makes it very reliable to land. Even if we're over here, uh, you know, off the pad because we got blown by the wind, we could actually stop it, fly it sideways, and we have done that. If you watch other launches, we realize we're off the pad, we stop it, and we slide to the middle. And um, That's why we can hit a postage stamp. Um, so the capsule. Um, we, we come down separately on these three giant parachutes, and there is a retro rocket system. You didn't quite see it, did you? Everyone says, oh, they must have broken their backs. <laughs> Welcome back, fairy bastardots. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Woo! <laughs> yeah, we didn't break our, I didn't break our backs. It was kind of, it was, it, I wouldn't say, I'm not gonna sit here and say it's like, you know, sitting on a soft bed, but it's perfectly fine. And um, you know, the retro rocket system, you don't see flame out of it, um, but it does slow us down. The reason you don't see flame out of it is, do you want to light a fire out here in the desert? <laughs> You're gonna have a brush fire. Um, so we, we don't, the rocket emits no flame. <laughs> okay, and then since we did, so we landed New Shepard for the first time um, on, uh, successfully on November 23rd, 2015. So we're coming up on the seven year anniversary. The more significant date was not actually that, it was two months later, January 23rd, 2016, that we did it the second time with the same rocket. So that, to me, that's the more important date because that's the first time we reused it, right? That's when, to me, the new space age began. November 23rd, 2016, the first time we successfully reused a rocket launch to space. Um, a lot has happened in that seven years. So that was the first successful landing. And then four weeks after uh, we did it, 
we were kind of in a head-to-head -head competition. Now, the Falcon 9 is understandably much larger vehicle, but again, they have nine engines, so it, in, in the waves, it, it, it is actually simpler to land a Falcon 9. But they did it four weeks uh, after we did. They had uh, attempted it um, many, many times before that and had failed. They had crashed, I believe, four or five times in a row before they, they were able to do it. Um, about July of last year, about uh, 17 months ago, was the first human flight of New Shepard. So that was actually 16 flight overall. So we had been testing it without people flying basically scientific missions. Um, up until then, we did it many times. Um, and Jeff, that's the flight, if you've heard in the news, that's the flight that Jeff Bezos uh, flew on, our founder, the, the, the owner of, um, the founder of Amazon.com and also the chairman of Blue Origin. Um, so that was, you know, people said, you must, wow, you're brave or you must have a lot of confidence in this team, um, you know, to basically pick yourself for the first flight. And, and he certainly had a lot of confidence. Um, and then I want to also point out, this is a picture from the SpaceX Inspiration4 mission, which was in September of that year. So last year was a very busy year for, human, uh, for space tourism, because that was the first private orbital, right? There's, if you run the models and you get to higher reuse, that number could go further and further down. So if we have a half billion dollar, sorry, 500 billion euro economy once when uh, you know, launch cost is 100 times <laughs> greater than it is in the future. Well, what that, will that mean for the new space age? The reason, that, the reason Blue Origin exists, right? Our motto, the company uh, motto is, we are working towards a vision where millions of people live and work in space to benefit Earth. Don't want to lose that second part, right? It's to benefit Earth. It's not to you know, put a bunch of rich people in the space or to colonize Mars or to have a plan B in case we get hit by an asteroid. No, Earth is the only true place that we know of that has a thriving ecosystem that humans, that is the permanent home of humanity. Um, so we are reaching out into space because we fundamentally believe, I fundamentally believe, that it is the only way, the best way, that we can preserve Earth. So um, I'm sure all of you are well aware that um, we have a crisis in, in our ecosystem. You know, according to the United Nations, that by various measures, we need two Earths in order to sustain human activity. We're using up the Earth's resources and polluting it at a rate that is twice as high as it can sustain. And that is right now. Um, by 2050, they predict we will need three Earths at the rate of growth. And that is still three Earths with billions of people living in abject poverty. What if everyone were to live like we live in the developed world, like in Prague, um, like in the United States? And we, shouldn't, we should hope that we increase the um, standard of living for people that are currently in abject poverty. Right. Well, if that was the case, we would need five Earths. We only have one Earth, one actual Earth. But the thing is, the solar system has unimaginable resources compared to Earth in terms of all different kinds of resources. So that is my prediction of what will be, what the new space age will be about will be going to space to preserve Earth and allow humanity to prosper. So if we, we think about Earth as a closed system, we cannot reach beyond it, then we will basically need, either we will need to cut our, our resource use, we will need to freeze population growth and cut our resource use by half, including allowing people, forcing people to remain in poverty. That is the future of humanity if we do not go to outer space. And that is because you know, the, the solar system has absolutely abundant resources. In, in some cases, or many orders of magnitude. Um, you know, this audience would especially know there are single asteroids, for example, 
that have more uh, metal reserves of many different kinds of metals than we have on the entire planet Earth. And that's because they're basically cores of planets. So we can't get to the center of the Earth where most of the uh, you know, most valuable metals have, have collapsed. But out there in, in the asteroid belt, there are exposed cores of former planets. There are worlds in the, in the outer solar system that have uh, under-crust under, uh, oceans that are multiple times larger than all of the, the oceans on Earth. The, the one most abundant resource in space is energy. Right? Earth has an energy crisis. There is no energy crisis in space. If you think about it, all 90% of the energy that we consume as a civilization comes from the sun. Okay? Fossil fuels. What are fossil fuels? They call them fossil fuels because they are the, the decayed plant and animal matter um, from millions and millions of years ago. We consume about one million years worth of fossil. Uh, we consume fossil fuels that took one million years to create every year. Um, but where did that come from? Plants and animals, the food chain, exists because of the sun. Um, solar panels, right? They don't represent a huge amount now, but that comes from the sun. Wind energy exists because um, the sun heats the atmosphere. The only thing that we don't use that doesn't directly come, the only thing we use that doesn't directly come from the sun in terms of energy is nuclear energy, but that's only about 10% of the world's energy supply. All energy basically comes from the sun, and yet the Earth sits here in space 150 million kilometers from the sun and it intercepts this tiny little bit of it. And the sun is spewing energy in all different directions, right? In fact, the amount of, of energy the sun is spewing out is one billion times 110 million times greater than we intercept on the Earth. That's how much energy is, is in the solar system. And yet we're you know, there's no energy crisis, right? So it has been studied various ways. This, this uh, picture animation is actually from, this, this picture is from the European Space Agency. It is theorized uh, in many studies that um, space-based solar power could be feasible at some future point in time. This was, these studies were from the 1980s. You know, the problem with solar panels on Earth, a, a few problems. Number one, you don't get any energy when it's at nighttime. And then if it's cloudy, you don't get any energy. And even on a good day, uh, there's absorption by the atmosphere. That, that is not a problem in space. You can put solar panels in space, um, and, and they could be illuminated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and with uh, microwave radiation, which could pass pretty harmlessly through the atmosphere, harmless, completely harm, harmlessly through the atmosphere, but you focus multiple beams to a collector on the ground, you can get an energy capture of about 85%, right? The studies on this, which were done in the 1980s, concluded that in order for this to be competitive with um, other forms of power like fossil fuels, we would need space launch costs to reduce by a factor of 10. So th that was dismissed at the time because no one, everyone said, we're never gonna get space flight that cheap. Well, it's gonna be the cheapest form of power when it's 100 times um, lower than it is now. And that is still launching solar panels from Earth, the surface of the Earth. But there, there is a bigger prize and, and that is the moon. So the moon has been described um, as the eighth continent. And, and I, I, like, I love that um, term because the moon is actually from the Earth, right? About one billion years after the formation of the Earth, about three and a half billion years ago, a planet, a protoplanet that we called Theia crashed into the Earth and two bodies formed from that, from that um, collision. One became the Earth and the other became the moon. So the moon is part of the Earth, and it has everything the Earth does except life. But what, what I mean by that, it has silicon, 24% of the moon is silicon, metals of all different types, 
By the way, between silicon and metals, you can make solar panels. It has hydrogen and oxygen, a lot of water, not necessarily in water form, but it's locked in hydroxyls, the OH molecule, and free hydrogen. Billions and billions of tons of water can be taken off the moon. Um, it has actual water in the form of ice, an estimated 660 metric tons in permanently shadowed craters. Rare earth elements, they are essential uh, elements in the lanthanide series of the periodic table that we need for industrial society. They're in batteries, they're in uh, um, integrated circuits. They are many times more abundant on the moon than they are on Earth. Um, and they're spe specifically in the mare regions, the, the, air, the light, the sort of darker colored regions that look like seas. They're in high abundance there. There is even carbon, nitrogen, and, and much more, right? Everything that we need for an industrial society exists on the moon, and in many cases in far greater abundance than on Earth. And the great thing about the moon is because it has no atmosphere and the gravity is weak, when you get to the moon and establish at least some infrastructure, you do not need rockets to launch it. On the moon, the, the escape velocity is about 1.7 kilometers per second. On Earth, it's about seven and a half. Sorry, um, that's the orbital uh, velocity of Earth. So it's much easier to get something off the moon. You can actually get it off by rail. You can get it off by electromagnetic catapult. So if you establish some type of way to harvest resources from the moon, you can launch those into Earth, towards Earth or into lunar orbit by electricity, by rail. Um, so th I love this quote, um, and it's a little misogynist, so excuse me, it was from the, a long time ago. If God wanted man to become a spacefaring species, he would have given man a moon. Right? The moon, much more so than Mars. I know there's, you know, public's enamored by Mars, but it takes six to eight months to get there. Really, what does it have going for it <laughs> that the moon doesn't? That's three and a half days away. If there's a problem, you can come back. Um, there, there is essentially not, nothing on Mars other than the, the, the science. And it's very compelling, don't get me wrong, going to Mars and exploring Mars is very compelling for science purposes, especially if there was life on Mars, and there certainly was never life on the moon. But in terms of a, a target for, re, for helping Earth, the moon is a much more compelling activity, uh, a place to go. So we are going back to the moon. This time we're going to stay. Um, you know, the, the dying relic of the old space age is this rocket, which I'm sure you'll recognize, the, the Space Launch System. There, uh, this is rolled out now in Cape Canaveral and Kennedy Space Center. Um, they're gonna try to launch it on Monday. And, and that is the start of, of uh, we'll have a, a little uh, capsule on it, um, not little, but six person capsule. There won't be anybody on it, but it's called the Orion capsule. I mean, it will attempt to circle the moon and then come back. Um, that's a $4 billion rocket. It's so expensive that NASA thinks they can only launch it once every other year, um, if, if, if they're lucky. Um, but that's not the only thing. Um, there's, there's a very vigorous now uh, program that, that even uh, European uh, industry is getting involved in. It's called the um, Eclipse Program, where NASA is sponsoring twice a year small landers that are made by commercial companies. And, and different um, industry groups or, or government agencies can rent space for payloads on these small landers. Um, there is, of course, the SpaceX Lunar Starship, which is also funded, um, where they'll take their Starship vehicle and attempt to land it on the moon. That will require a lot of refuel, uh, refueling in space. And this is the, uh, the design of the Blue Origin Lunar Lander. That is the ultimate a mission for, for the New Glenn launch vehicle, which we're developing. So we're going back to the moon, and I'm convinced we're going back this time to stay. So what will, it, what will we do on the moon um, you know, when, it, when this becomes a reality? Um, because it's enabled by not the $4 billion space launch system, but by 
uh, these much less expensive large vehicles, which we're going to be reusing. Uh, I mean, there's, there's certainly plenty of science to do on the moon. This is a mission that NASA is in the very early stages of planning, which is the Lunar Far Side Telescope. If you've ever seen the Arecibo Telescope, which is built into sort of a bowl-shaped depression in Puerto Rico, um, imagine what a telescope that is built into a crater that is on the far side of the moon so it never sees the light of Earth, uh, what, what it could see, how deeply it can look into the cosmos. But, it, but I ultimately think that if we restrict human activity to science, we're never, we're never going to see the true benefit of the new space age. Instead, um, you know, I, I envision that we're going to see industrial civilization on the moon. We're going to exploit those resources. It might live in lunar cities, but one of the uh, disadvantages of a lunar city is that you're living in these small pressurized environments. Um, the gravity is, I think it's going to feel great to be in lunar gravity for a while, but it is going to be a little annoying. So here I'm, I'm going to get into some speculation. This is, might sound like science fiction, but um, science fiction you know, of today is often the reality of tomorrow. What uh, we think about at Blue Origin, uh, not, and this is more of in our dream state, but we have pictures like this all over our headquarters. You can't turn your head without looking at this. this is an imagining of, of uh, what is called an O'Neill cylinder. And, and it's called that because Gerard O'Neill um, spearheaded the concept at Princeton University in 1970s. And so he imagined that in the future, when people live in space, they will not live on the planetary surfaces because their gravity is too low. But instead, they would live in these giant um, habitats that were made from, this, from materials catapulted from the lunar surface. And the scale that he imagined was huge. You know, we can get to different scales, but this is, you know, the, the design that his uh, team at, at Princeton came up with was 32 kilometers long. That's the scale. Um, and so he thought they would be spinning and generating artificial gravity, uh, one, one G of artificial gravity. And, and at that size, they, they would spin at such a slow rate that you would not perceive it. Um, and that there would also be these, these solar reflectors uh, on panels that would direct light or absorb light um, to power the station. You know, this might sound fanciful, but if you can get industrial scale mining and harvesting on the moon, there's no reason that physics doesn't allow this, right? And, and a 32 kilometer long structure actually is um, a small scale structure compared to the amount of construction we do in an average city, okay? So he envisioned millions of people living in even a single one of these cylinders, which, you know, there's an artist's conception of what it might look like in the center. I don't know if this is going to happen, but it's, it's great to dream about what is possible when it is inexpensive to go to space and that you put a foothold on the moon and can start to utilize its resources. You know, if you run the numbers, you can create thousands of these habitats with the materials just on the first few meters of the lunar surface, which would mean trillions of human beings. And, and by the, I don't just mean the the construction, I mean all of the resources, the nitrogen for the atmosphere, the water for the lakes, um, and then the base carbon for um, all the plants. All of these materials exist on the moon, and so it's a matter of scale that might make us flabbergasted, but this is possible. It might not happen in my lifetime, it might not happen even in your lifetime, um, but maybe in our children's lifetime. So, I mean, ultimately, what will happen in the new space age? I mean, many, most of the people in this room are quite young. And when I, as, again, I make uh, these slides for future port youth, um, the, the youth of the world, and, and that is entirely up to you, right? When, what we are focusing on at Blue Origin is not any of these fanciful dreams. We're focusing on 
you know, a hundredfold or more decrease in space access. So you can decide what to do with it. And we hope, you know, and I, I firmly believe that there's huge opportunity to make the world a better place to benefit Earth when, when um, the access to all these resources is so inexpensive. So, and with that, that, that is the conclusion of my talk. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.